Good evening, everybody. I'm excited to talk with all of you about merchant acquisitions, or M&A, tonight. M&A is actually a topic that has kind of followed me personally. So I used to work for McKinsey Company, a consulting company, and supported various acquisitions, especially on the post-merger integration. I saw a lot of successful examples, but I also saw a lot of less successful examples, where years after the acquisition, people would still have different email addresses, or where the new unified marketing strategy failed before it was even rolled out. About two years ago, I was part of a company that got acquired by Amazon. So I learned from the inside what it means to be acquired and what really cultural integration feels like. Stepping back a little bit and taking on a broader market view, the value of global M&A is tremendous. It is cited to be over four trillion US dollars. However, it turns out that many buyers are actually overvaluing the synergies of what acquisitions could actually make. And if you browse online, you will find, find articles claiming anything from 50 to 90% of acquisitions or M&A deals fail. And this failing means not deals not closing, but deals closing and not being successful. Failures can mean that, result, uh, that the buyer has giant losses, that the buyer might divest the seller, or that you have mass exodus of critical talent. The purpose of tonight is to understand how to do M&A in the right way and how to actually make acquisitions successful. We have people here in the audience who have probably considered selling their own little startup, or we had people who probably have been part of an acquisition themselves. The goal is to provide a holistic view of M&A, and so we put a panel together that can help us to understand the buyer side as well as the seller side and gain insights around their experience they made. Here are our four speakers for tonight. We will start with Camillo Beckdash. Camillo is a partner at McKinsey Company based in Los Angeles. Thank you for coming up all the way. Camillo, Camillo is specialized in uh, organizational topics and he's a leader of the org practice. And in this role, he has seen actually many acquisitions. Camillo will set the stage tonight about M&A. He will provide an industry overview and share specific successful and unsuccessful examples. He will dive into success criteria and outline what it takes to win. I'm excited to have him here tonight because I think he will provide a unique outsider perspective on M&A. Our second speaker will be Daniel Lender. Daniel is the CFO of QAD, a Santa Barbara-based software company, where he has been for 21 years. In his time, he has seen over 20 acquisitions. Daniel will share his experience from the buyer's perspective. He will share what he learned from the different types of acquisitions, the varying drivers and reason behind, and how the different seller types, private equity versus founder, influence the acquisition process. I believe Daniel can provide a unique perspective, a long-term perspective, since he has seen many acquisitions throughout the years and their performance within as part of QAD. Our third speaker will be Mike Pugh. Mike was a founding member of EFAX when it got acquired by J2 Global. While Mike was a general manager and the head of marketing at J2 Global, the company acquired over 100 other companies, with him directly being involved in about 50 deals. Similar to Daniel, Mike will also present the buyer side. Where, Mike, where Mike's experience will differ from Daniel's is not only in the number of deals, but the very transactional approach he provided how to evaluate targets, how to rationalize products, and how to align budgets. I'm excited to have him on the panel and ha having him hear the do's and don'ts of the many acquisitions he has seen and talk about M&A at scale. Our fourth speaker will be Kevin O'Connor. Kevin is a serial entrepreneur who founded various and sold various companies. He is also a venture capitalist and acquired a few companies himself. Tonight, I asked him to present the seller side. He will share insights from his experience founding and selling DoubleClick, one of the first internet companies that he sold to a private equity company for a billion dollars. He will also share from his more recent experience when he sold a Santa Barbara-based data aggregation company called Graphic to Amazon in 2017. I was actually working for Kevin when he sold Graphic to Amazon. And I do remember that during the diligent process, it became very apparent to me and the rest of the team that this was not his first rodeo. 
He gave very specific advice of what information to share and what not to share and how the process would look like. I'm looking forward to having him share that same advice with all of you tonight. With that, I will make space for the first speaker and ask Camilla to come up here. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I want to thank uh, 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 for the invitation today and, and, and your time here today. Um, as uh, Heike said, I do a lot of my work in organization, but I do a lot of my work around big transformations. And when I think about M&A and a merger and how a deal gets done, it's, it's an infliction point, uh, an inflection point uh, where organizations are coming together, where value is created, um, and, uh, and, and it's a very exciting topic. And we've seen quite a bit of that uh, over the last uh, five years, um, especially over the last couple years at, at McKinsey. And so I wanted to today kind of walk you through a couple themes, uh, but then actually dive into what do we think it takes uh, to be successful uh, when you put two organizations together. So a couple things that, that we've seen, um, if you look at the, the just the, we'll go through this in a second, the kind of trends overall, um, you know, deals have fallen since 2015, um, but they still remain a very uh, active and, and at a high level. And I think what you saw in 2015 was uh, uncertainty of what was going to happen in the election in 2016 and a lot of deals starting to close, um, but um, uh, that has continued. I think you, you'll, you'll see also that the geographic distribution of where deals are remains consistent between Europe, Asia, and the U.S., uh, with, with the Americas uh, really being bulk of that, but with uh, quite a bit of, um, I think, some uptick uh, in Asia, really driven by what we're seeing in China. Um, one interesting point is we're seeing more hostile deals, and we're seeing more hostile deals uh, in value uh, at stake, uh, which is something I think is, is a little bit indicative of, of the kind of mood and, and what's happening with, uh, I, I think, you know, um, more deals uh, uh, actually going through. Um, and then I think uh, the other piece, which is a, a big element of this, is um, we're seeing more deals local. Uh, and so a lot less, I think, not uh, extremely uh, less, but a little bit less uh, cross-border activity. And I think that has to do with just the political climate that we're seeing. But those are, I think, our five overall trends uh, that we've been seeing overall. Uh, in 2017, we had a, a quite a bit of um, uh, activity, and here's the top 15 deals. Uh, there was quite a bit of activity in the healthcare space. Uh, we saw quite a bit of activity in, in, in transportation and logistics, uh, but some of the big uh, movement was around media and telecommunications. Uh, a lot of that was driven, I think, between this, uh, the battle versus brick versus click. Uh, you're seeing a lot of, in the consumer sector, uh, kind of brick-and-mortar stores really starting to think about, you know, how do they expand? So uh, with Walmart uh, uh, buying uh, uh, Bonobos, you saw Amazon uh, buying Whole Foods, really thinking about distribution in a very different way, which was really driving uh, quite a bit of the deals. If we look at 2018, uh, you would see that, um, you know, Comcast, Sky, T-Mobile, Sprint, up there at the top, and so uh, really driven, I think, by uh, what were happening in the, in the media uh, and, and telecommunications world with more consolidation. I think you're going to see much more of that as we look at a couple big players uh, in this field. Um, let me give you a little bit of the landscape uh, of what we saw. So we saw in 2015, as I mentioned, um, you know, kind of a, a high, but we, we saw a little bit of a, a, a dip uh, uh, the 2017, um, you know, part of that I think was just not having a lot of uh, uh, big deals uh, in 17. But 2018 uh, was was a, a pretty good year. We actually saw an increase, and so the number that would be here uh, in 2018 would be a uh, 4.1 uh, trillion dollars in in value. And a part of that was. Uh, uh, driven by a couple big deals. Uh, part of that was driven, I think, by the uh, uh, economic climate. So if I think of the big notable deals in 2018, uh, you, you saw a lot at the, at, in the healthcare space, Cigna Express Scripts. You saw in, in the energy space uh, a moving, and then you saw 
as we said, T-Mobile Sprint um, and Comcast Sky. Uh, but there were some other underlying things that were happening uh, that I think were driving quite a bit of the deals in 2018. One, uh, you had a massive tax, um, uh, a tax cut, which put a lot of money in, in uh, pockets of these corporations to make activity. Uh, you saw more shareholder uh, activism, uh, and I think more kind of a view of how do we get short-term returns, uh, which meant that you saw more movement into inorganic growth, uh, with a lot of shareholders actually making acquisitions in the, in the short term, uh, which we've heard quite a bit, I think, in the, in the political scene, uh, and I think will be a big debate uh, going into uh, over the next year, but there was, a, was quite a bit of, of movement inorganically. And I think you also had organizations that were looking, how do we actually buy and build capabilities uh, in the short term? So uh, great examples of that, I think, in, in, in the pharma uh, sector, we saw quite a bit of uh, movement of folks instead of creating their own pharmaceuticals or drugs, but actually buying the R&D and bringing that to market uh, relatively fast. Um, and so that, I think, trend we're actually seeing, uh, we saw in 2018, and I think we'll actually see uh, in 2019 uh, uh, as well. Uh, you'll, you'll see actually the, uh, the, the red line is just the number of deals uh, that have gone. And so while well, the value was, I think, at, at uh, you know, the high of 2015, I think that relatively has, has evened out. Um, if I think about where deals are being made, um, it's remained pretty consistent uh, between Europe, the Americas, and Asia. Um, and while we've seen uh, a bit of a decrease uh, in, uh, in America, we've actually, I think what has been somewhat interesting is you've actually seen an increase uh, in some of the deals uh, coming out of, out of Asia, out of APAC. Um, and uh, you know, a decrease a bit in the share from, from the Americas. I think you're going to see uh, more of that if you think about what China is doing in the market. Um, you know, as we speak right now, I think the Premier is actually uh, out on a road show uh, in, uh, in Pakistan and in India. They've announced, I think, China, this One Belt Run Road initiative uh, uh, where there is a lot of infusion and I think um, attraction to make deals uh, in Asia. And I think you're only going to see more of that as we think of the political climate. I think one of the trends uh, that has made this a bit different than others is uh, the geographic between the U.S., between China, uh, and, and a lot of just kind of uncertainty, uh, which I think is also leading to, I think, many more kind of local deals happening. Um, and I think that will, will continue to play out. Um, you know, there was a time where hostile deals uh, were, uh, were not the norm. I think what you've seen is uh, an increase uh, in hostile deals, and while the number of, of, of hostile deals, I think, uh, has actually flattened out or decreased somewhat over the last two years, the value uh, has, uh, has gotten uh, a quite uh, large. Um, and, and so that, I think, will continue to be, I think, a, a good example of that, uh, the Kraft uh, Unilever, I think you've also started to see uh, deals as a whole where, um, you know, there's been regulatory blocks. Uh, so I think the Qualcomm Broadcom was a, a, Broadcom, uh, was a big deal that we saw uh, uh, that was denied over the last uh, two years. And so that was, a, I think, another trend uh, that we'll kind of continue to see. Um, when I think about deals that are being made, I think we're seeing many more deals made at the local level. Uh, for, for a couple reasons. Uh, one, I think if you look at, at uh, Europe uh, and the slide between kind of cross-regional uh, deals, so if you look at uh, just in 2016, 46% of deals there down to 26 and 17, I think a lot of that has to do with some of the populist rhetoric uh, uh, and, and just some of the kind of uh, geoeconomic uh, political issues happening in that area. I think you're seeing more deals uh, happening uh, kind of at the domestic uh, level than some of the big kind of cross uh, national and I think you'll you'll start to see that as as you go forward and and so when we look at 2019 I think we see uh, you know at least in uh, even in our, our first couple months here uh, quite a bit of activity and we should expect that I think going in uh, to the new year um, I think you know some of the things as we think about um, 
in the work that I do, what do you need to do to be successful in a deal? And an M&A. And there's a couple things that come out. So this was a response that we had done uh, with a, fo- a few folks at a, at a, at a recent offsite or forum uh, with, with CEOs. And the number one issue that, that came up was uh, culture and, and building uh, organizational compatibility between two. And so one of the, I think, the, the biggest things that we see in, in M&A uh, is you can get the value, you can get the sy- synergies, uh, but if you don't get the culture right, uh, that is a place where uh, it usually leads to um, you know, a deal being unsuccessful and, and just a ton of issues uh, coming out of that. And it's probably the one thing that I think when we see uh, is something that is under, I think, addressed uh, uh, going forward. I think technology integration um, is, an, is another area that we've you know, heard that is quite a bit. Uh, as something that you just got to get right, and getting the right resources and talent uh, in the right places are those things that you know just you see as something that people are focused on and and need to be focused on uh, to get right going forward. Um, there's a couple things that we actually think about on day one. That I often tell uh, some of my clients: uh, one, you should always be solving for you know the unexpected. Uh, whether it be where do I create value, whether it be what are the synergies that we need to get, but um, you know, oftentimes I think we're uh, we're so you know, clients are so kind of caught up in what the the deal is uh, or what the the business plan was, but uh, you should always expect the unexpected. Um, you always want to plan ahead. I, I find that whenever we're doing deals, there's a you know. Our experience suggests a two to five percent uh, revenue loss, and so how you actually think about mitigating that uh, is is critical. Uh, where you focus the management team, I think, is is quite important. There's only a limited amount of of resources and capabilities, and so one of the things that we often do when we're going into a deal and supporting an integration is really targeting uh, where. Uh, where you're, you're putting management attention um, and, and making sure that it is focused on, on the, the kind of highest uh, issues because not every risk is equal. Um, always thinking about talent. So you see often just this kind of loss of talent, especially in the first uh, couple or the first year of a deal. And so really focusing and kind of obsessing about where your talent is and how do I make sure that I know where, where that is and, and, and keep that tal- talent. Uh, we've seen quite a few, you know, often folks want to get in this kind of M&A routine, and, and so how you actually build a playbook that works for your organization is, is critical. I see that with a lot of my uh, PE clients. Um, you know, as you think about M&A uh, and you think about uh, what you're actually doing, it is an infliction point when you put two organizations together, and often is a time where you actually can think about how do I upgrade my, my talent and my leadership and what that looks like. And then I think the last thing is often um, you know, establishing what the right culture is and what the right operating model is. And I can't emphasize that enough as, as an area that you just gotta get right uh, from day one. Um, when I think about organization and a lot of what you know, folks do, we often think about um, in organizations, uh, you know, uh, lines and boxes. And so how am I going to put these two organizations together? What are, you know, what's the structure going to be? There's so much energy that goes into figuring out what role everyone has, where they're going to sit in the organization. Um, But there is a lot more uh, to that. When I think of organization operating model, it's not only the structure of the organization, uh, it's the processes and the people. And, and frankly, I think getting the processes right of how you put two organizations that are wired very differently into one is probably uh, one of the most important things I think you can do. Uh, and then getting the people right. What is my right talent? Uh, what are the skills that I need? What's the culture that I need to get right? And what are some of those informal networks uh, to make sure that we have from day one? Uh, all of that going into, that I think you got to get right uh, prior to uh, any uh, day one close, uh, but um, you know it's it's usually the kind of focus uh, going into the first couple months of a new management team. Um, you know, culture is a is a driver of of synergies, and it's also uh, um, something that um, 
you know, is, is, can also actually, I think, accelerate, um, you know, the success of an organization and a, and a deal that gets right. Um, you know, uh, these are uh, some of the things that as we look to this past year and just kind of in our experience at a, at a kind of a, uh, at a, at a, at a, a big level, you know, two very different organizations, the Disney company, uh, at 21st Century Fox, an example of if you're going to get this right, it, it's actually getting those two uh, organizations and the culture right. One of the things I think about over the last year or a couple years was Amazon's acquisition of Whole Foods. And one of the issues I think that came out of that deal was uh, just two very different cultures. You had Amazon, which was very kind of focused, I think, on, on targets, uh, a much more competitive, I think, atmosphere, and Whole Foods uh, uh, being a much more local uh, kind of Austin brand. And, you know, you, you go into the stores, and a lot of uh, what you see is, uh, is actually, I think, Amazon kind of integrating uh, uh, some of their things into Whole Foods and be interesting to see what, what happens there. But they've actually, I think, slowed a lot of their integration and kind of uh, how they bring those two together uh, uh, based on just having to get the cultures right. And so I think you'll see uh, quite a bit of that actually as we go forward. Uh, analysts, uh, and I think if we just look at the outlook in 2019, I think we're going to see uh, quite a bit. Uh, you know, I think there is a, a pretty positive outlook on the deals that are getting done. I've seen uh, a lot of smaller deals kind of in that, uh, you know, 100 million, the, the 500 million uh, um, range uh, happen. I, I expect to see quite a bit more of that uh, just from some of the trends that we saw at the end of, of 2018. Um, but I do think you'll also see some of the kind of bigger deals, especially kind of in the, the media and technology space. And so it is an exciting time as we think about M&A activity going into 2019. It is an exciting time as we also think about, you know, how do you actually uh, put organizations together and make sure that uh, you set this up for, for success. So that's a little bit of overview uh, that I wanted to give of just what we as a firm have been seeing uh, across uh, the globe in, in M&A and, and uh, you know, some markers of success going forward. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you, Matthew and Heike, for having us here. Very much appreciate it. As you pro probably know, QED is a public company, so I have to show you this slide. I'm going to test you at the end. So where did your iPhone come from? Or where uh, did your car that's sitting in your garage or here in the parking lot come from? Uh, or where's that beer that's sitting in your fridge or that you're drinking? How did that get made? How did it get in your hands? Manufacturing is a very complex uh, process. It's a global process. And uh, at QED, uh, that's what we're all about. Manufacturers start with thinking about what it is that consumers are actually going to buy. Uh, they plan and they think about how they're going to get their uh, products uh, how will they actually make those products, plan for the actual production, how are then they going to get those products over to the different consumers around the world. They'll have to deal with uh, export from wherever these products are being made. Uh, they'll then transport them via different means to different warehouses around the world. And uh, then they'll need to manage the import process and then to manage the warehousing. They need to think about how they get them to the different retailers and eventually into uh, your hands uh, um, or your mouths if they are selling you food. So at QED, uh, what we do is we help global manufacturing process, uh, companies manage that entire process. And uh, whether you are an automotive um, uh, supplier, uh, about 93 of the top 100 cars, in, selling cars in the world, uh, actually have QAD parts in them. Uh, whether it is the seats uh, being manufactured by a company like Lear, uh, or TRW making the disc brakes. Um, think about the plane that you took, that glass that's sitting in the cockpit um, it was likely made by our customer, St. Gabon. 
or um, in the high-tech area, uh, companies like Saft, they make uh, power products and batteries and so forth, uh, again, using QED products. Inside your house, if you like to cook, Decor, one of our customers, if you've cooked and your uh, Decor uh, cooktop, um, uh, you've probably uh, not knowing, but uh, was made with QED software. Uh, or uh, recently we had Valentine's Day, so you, maybe you order some jewelry from Kendra Scott to your significant other. If you didn't, better late than never, you can still do that. Uh, or um, in f food and beverage, um, if you like honey, manuka honey uh, from, um, uh, from New Zealand, um, uh, made by our customer Convita, uh, is sitting in our shelves in local supermarkets. And finally, medical device companies use QAD to manufacture the products, manage uh, and keep track of all the parts that go into these devices, uh, and comply with FDA or other regulatory agencies around the world. Uh, hopefully, this patient is not getting all these procedures done at the same time. <laughs> okay, but how do we do that? Uh, QAD has been in business for quite a long time. Um, last year, uh, we had a, a bit over $300 million in revenue. We've been shifting from being a traditional software company to pr being a cloud uh, software as a service provider. About a third of our revenue last year was uh, cloud revenue. and. Um, we have offices directly in 19 countries, but we have customers in over 100, uh, in 100 uh, uh, places around the world. Um, our cloud software has been, and it's been used by customers in about 43 places in 43 countries. And um, uh, they, um, they, they use it, again, to manufacture and to get all these products into um, uh, yours and, and uh, everybody's hands. We've grown mainly organically, but over the years, we've done a number of acquisitions around the world. You can see we've been from you know, South Africa to Asia, North America, and, and Europe. And these acquisitions have been driven by specific needs that the company has had over time. Some of them have been relating to technology. There's a particular piece of, or set of technologies that were important for us to implement into our overall product strategy, and that's what led to that particular acquisition. Or may have been related to capability, whether it was we needed certain people in certain locations in order to serve our customers, or we needed people that had a very specific skill set, and that's what led to that, those particular acquisitions. In some cases, complete solutions, so companies that actually have a particular product that um, has customers, uh, implementations, and so forth, and we wanted to incorporate that solution as part of our overall solution that we provide to our customers around the world. So generally, what's led QAD to acquire companies has been around market offering. You know, what do we offer to our vertical markets that we would like to serve? and uh, what capabilities do we need around the world in order to serve those customers. There's other strategies, however, however, as to why companies actually go out and acquire other companies. Some cases, they want to break them up. The parts are worth more than the whole. In other situations, uh, they want to roll up a number of companies that do similar things in order to serve a broad market. In some cases, companies just want to get bigger. People just think bigger is better, bigger is worth more, they just want to get bigger, and that's their strategy is to simply grow by acquiring other, other, other companies. In other cases, competition. Hard to beat the competition, let's buy the competition. Uh, or synergies by combining two entities. Uh, there's been some articles now about the fact that sometimes those synergies don't quite work, but that's nevertheless some of the strategies that companies use. And whether it's integration, whether it's vertical integration or horizontal integration that these companies have, and uh, that's why they um, uh, go about acquiring other companies. So one of the main things that people think about when think about acquisitions is valuations. Like whether you're a buyer or a seller, that's the first thing you think about. Well, how much am I going to get for this company or how much is this company going to cost me? So a lot of people, when they think about valuation, 
multiple. It's mu multiple of EBITDA or multiple of profitability or cash flow or some, something ar um, around that. And those are typically used, uh, they're standards by industry and so forth. Now, EBITDA a lot of times is dependent about on, on size as well. Despite what some, somebody might tell you, size does matter when it comes to acquisitions. The bigger the company, typically the, the higher the multiple for a like company uh, that we'll actually get. But size matters also going looking ahead. So growth rate is very important. Companies that are growing are clearly worth a lot more than companies that are um, uh, not growing very fast. But these are typically financial things that people look at when valuing acquisitions. There's a number of other areas as well. Does the company have a particular set of technologies that's highly valuable that either they developed uh, or they have purchased over time? Does the company have a specific set of skill sets that are very hard to get um, by hiring people? So that's the human capital, that has value. And what is the market that the company is addressing? How big is this market? So if, whether you're buying or selling a company and trying to determine the value, understanding what that total available market is, is very important in you know, either selling how much value your company is, or when you're a buyer, understanding what it represents. But all of this is really critical Timing. The same companies are worth very different numbers depending on when you're buying or when you're selling the company. So, um, you know, keep that very much in mind. If you're, if, if you're an entrepreneur and you have a company that you're trying to sell, you know, timing is key. Now, in the years that we've done a number of these acquisitions, I've encountered all kinds of sellers. I can roughly think about the sellers in two camps. The first one is a professional seller. So it's typically a private equity firm. They have usually bought a company at some point in time, done something to it, grown it, uh, trimmed it down in terms of cost and so forth to make it more valuable. And uh, they're a very motivated seller. Uh, they know what they want. They basically want to get as much uh, as possible. Uh, they want to minimize the amount of long-term liability that they could potentially have by selling the company. They've done this tons of times, so they're very well organized. The process tends to go very, very quickly. Integration is very efficient, and the management that comes with the company is professional management. Uh, they're used to dealing with shareholders and so forth. The second type um, are founder-led companies or founders-led companies. Now, that's a whole different set of circumstances that you're dealing with. You end up a lot of times with split personality. Sometimes it's a split personality of one founder. Sometimes it's a whole number of people that are involved in the process. Uh, they're very emotionally attached, right? It's their baby that they've started, that they've grown, um, that they have, you know, a lot of a lot of emotional attachment to. Uh, a lot of times they have multiple goals. You know, they want to maximize value, but they also want to let's make sure that the company, you know, maintains its its. It's culture, it's identity, the people are, are going to be uh, um, taken care of, etc. And a lot of them, present company excluded Kevin, are, tend to be quite naive, you know, when it comes to, because they've never done this before. You know, how many, you know, how many people sell companies lots of times? Unless you're in private equity, you typically don't do that. Uh, so they tend to get overwhelmed with the entire process. Sometimes their business actually suffers during that process, so it's something they need to actually watch for. Um, and the integration can be challenging. The process in general is actually uh, significantly slower. So people also tend to think about when it comes to the acquisitions, part of the process is the negotiation, the due diligence that comes with it. So just a few thoughts around that. One is prepare. Uh, so if you're thinking about buying a company, you're thinking about selling a company, uh, get the right advisors um, at their, you know, as early as possible. Don't, you know, don't get them too early. Um, you don't want them to kind of push you to sell a company. But once you're ready to make that step, get them as early as possible. Uh, you want a financial advisor. You want legal counsel. Uh, and use the process of selecting them as free education. Right, interview many of them and get as much information as you can from that. 
and get really organized. It's going to really help in that process once you actually go through the acquisition. Some of the key terms that uh, think about price, clearly that's what everybody's focused on. Uh, but with price also comes, there's a number of other things like the timing of payments. Are you, is there any variability to those payments? Any contingencies, uh, any earnouts, et cetera? That's all you know, very, very important. Disclosures is another important thing when it comes to the contracts. A lot of sellers tend to think, well, I'm not going to, you know, I don't want to tell people this or that and so forth. And yes, there's certain things that maybe you don't want to, you know, open the kimono completely. But generally speaking, you want to be upfront. You want to, you want to prepare the buyer uh, with that. And it's actually going to reduce your liability uh, if you are actually, if you're disclosing everything that should be disclosed. Um, uh, Eventually, the, fire, the buyer is going to find out anyway. Um, and then, uh, whether you do an asset deal or an equity deal, and sometimes in the middle of the acquisition, that tends to go back and forth, uh, depending on the needs of the buyer and the needs of the seller. Obviously, from a seller standpoint, there's also usually significant tax consequences of doing the transaction one way or another way. And then the diligence piece, a lot of people tend to think about diligence as well as this big financial process that I'm going to have to go through. And that is true. That's a significant part of it. But diligence actually involves you know, a lot more other things. Diligence around the culture of the firm that is being acquired and, and diligence from somebody who's being acquired by the culture of the firm that is acquiring. Uh, technical issues, uh, whether they are uh, technology that you intend to sell or internal technology issues, customers, you know, if you're buying a company, you know, talk to those customers early on, don't wait until the end. People, you know, what, what's their motivation and so forth and strategy. So some final thoughts um, on this. Um, number one, approaches like you're dating somebody, maybe online dating, that's, I, th I heard the new thing to do, but um, not, not, not in my time. Uh, but you know, they, you, know, you wanna really, you're courting the person or the organization that's acquiring you and vice versa, they're courting you. But ask a lot of questions and make sure that you know, uh, that's, that's going the right way. Also, really make sure this, there's gotta be a strategic fit. Unless you're just you know, selling to, um, um, you just want you just want out. <laughs> they really you really need to be looking for a, a strategic fit. That's going to work best for 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 both the, the acquirer and the acquirer um, uh, in the in the long run. If that works, that process of getting alignment in terms of price, in terms of everything that goes with it, uh, it's going to go a lot smoother. It can be quite frustrating and lengthy, but you know if those two work. Uh, that will come together, so be patient. And approach the entire thing as you're gonna be living together uh, for a long time. So anything you do in that dating process in that, that entire uh, uh, you know, lengthy uh, structure is going to impact you know, how that household gets along uh, after the transaction is over. So thank you very much. For context, I'm not an M&A guy. I'm a product and marketing guy who's done a lot of M&A. Um, so realize when I'm talking, I'm going through that specific lens of what my experiences were. Um, I was acquired once. I was with a company called Efax, and we got bought in 2000, kind of uh, when the, the, the bubble burst, and uh, got my experience being acquired. For those of you that know Michael Crandell, he was the deal lead on that. When the deal got finished, um, he moved on to other things. He kind of gave me the shove in the back. And I was the, the front man for that business going forward, and I learned a ton. Um, I went into it a little bit like, I don't know if you know The Princess Bride, but there's Wesley, the farm boy, um, gets captured by um, the Dread Pirate Roberts. And I think every, every morning, um, the Dread Pirate tells him, good job, Wesley, sleep well, I'll probably kill you in the morning. And um, ultimately, Wesley becomes the Dread Pirate Roberts. And if you haven't seen The Princess Bride, it's my favorite movie. But I kind of went into it that way, not knowing what I was going to get into, thinking as the new guy carrying a business into the acquired business into a new company, every day I was learning something, and it could be that I was just getting it to a certain point, and I would be whacked. And ultimately, I made it 15 years. And, um, and over time, I think half of the executive team at J2 Global, which was a public company, I think we grew to about $650 million in revenue before I left, Half of the executive teams was acquirees. 
And so we brought in people and who had certain expertise, who had a passion for their business, and ultimately they became part of a, of a growing public company. Um, I was an acquirer dozens of times. J2 did 100 deals while I was there. Some of them were not really in my business unit, so I wasn't particularly involved, but I was involved deeply in many of them. Um, ultimately, all of those uh, acquisitions led into a $250 million portfolio of e-commerce SaaS companies. Um, what we found is in, in, in bad times, initially, we found we could buy companies because they were at better prices, they had fewer options. In good times, we did organic growth. And through a couple shifts of those, through good and bad times of flexing our muscles on M&A and flexing our muscles on organic growth, we got pretty good at both, so we're able to balance those in order to grow the company. And again, just as you, everything's coming through a marketing and product guy lens, I have a bias for profitability. Um, if you've heard of the rule of 40, it's a balance between your profitability and your growth rate, and if it's 40, you're doing a good job. And J2 did that, but J2 did it um, mostly on the profitability end. I think our, our uh, gross margins were in the 80s and 90s like there with a lot of SaaS companies, but our operating margins were typically above 30%. So we made money, and so when we bought companies, the idea was to make money. So again, what you'll see from me is comes through that lens. Um, my role, so I worked with a great corp dev guy, and my role was to identify targets. So I was running a SaaS uh, organization, and I would look for, I need a presence in Germany because we can't do certain types of business there without it. I need a great digital signature product to feed into our online fax business. Um, I need a certain type of uh, business model that we're not good at. So I would identify targets, things that I wanted to be in my portfolio, and I'd partner with a corp dev guy to make the deals happen. Um, I would develop models. I would figure out if we buy this company at this amount and they have this much revenue and they have this much cost and we can apply scale to their credit card processing and drive a percentage point out of their, their costs on every single dollar earned. If I can um, get better deals with agencies for their ad, ad buys because I have more negotiating power, we'd go through and we'd develop a model to figure out what a company was really worth to us, separate from what it was doing before we bought them, what are we worth to us afterwards. So I'd develop a model to figure out whether a deal was feasible or not. Um, I would rationalize products and pricing. Once we're bringing in a business, we'd have to figure out how does their product line mesh with ours? Is it incremental or does it overlap and do we have to figure out some way of either merging things or creating some uh, realistic differentiation in the mind of the customer? I would imagine uh, messaging and customer experience. So once we bring uh, a business on board, what do we tell the customers? I think a lot of gets talked about what happens with employees, which is very important, but there's another very important thing. When, you, when your vendor gets bought, what does that mean to you? So there's an art to, to dealing with, with, uh, with the customers to make sure they believe that this is a, a pro for them and not a con and they don't start looking for other vendors. Because uh, you mentioned that you know, two to five percent of the revenue walks out the door. For a guy running a business unit, that's not okay. So our job was how do we make it so that doesn't happen? Um, consolidate vendors and campaigns. Um, you know, we, we liked our vendors, we got great deals, we tip, typically like to buy companies and merge them onto the platforms that we were using, both in terms of simplicity, being able to run the business as well as for cost. Um, I would align budgets and reporting. Typically, as soon as you buy a company, um, you've got everybody who likes their own platform, they like their own dashboards, they like all that stuff. Very quickly, you've got to bring it together and figure out what the overall budgets are and how you measure one business unit or one product line against another. And last, and maybe one of the most important things, get to the new normal as quickly as possible. Um, time is typically not your friend on doing deals. Time is not your friend on doing integrations either. The faster you can get to, if, if, if somebody's gotta go, the faster they're gone, the better. If you gotta hire somebody, the faster you hire them, the better. The quicker you get to a new normal and people start believing, and again, to use myself as the example, when we got bought by J2 Global, I was not sure, it probably took me a year to realize I was staying both because I, that I decided I was gonna stay and that they decided to keep me. Um, if you go that through, the whole, every staff member in the organization, every vendor, every relationship, every customer, all go through that same thing. Is, is this something that's gonna work for me in a new relationship? The quicker you can get to the new normal, the better. And we even did some things where we would do some of the stuff you would normally think about doing an in integration before the deal was done. We would have somebody we're planning on buying and say, a critical component of us buying you is that we can integrate your billing system with our billing system. And we'd say, so we'll make it a condition that we're not gonna finish the deal until you prove that, that, that you have those plugins that we can do that easily, so that when we hit the ground running the day after the acquisition, we could flip the switch. So for us, getting to the new normal might be one of the most important things you can do once you get a deal done. So for us, there's a continuum of deals. 
And I'd say at the far left extreme, there's buying a customer. And so here, you're really talking about, can we, we're buying a revenue stream, and we're figuring out how profitable we can make it. And so this is really not a, you know, a fancy technology buy. This is figuring out, I'm in a business, you're in the same business. Um, how can we bring your customer base in, uh, into our uh, organization and grow from there? And here, the, the keys typically are retention. Can you keep that customer from defecting? Can you give them a story that makes them believe that life will be better for them? And then it's about making better margins. How do you cut expenses out of the business so that you can take a business you bought at one, at one valuation, and by the time you run your magic, it's worth much more? And it's that arbitrage that's a key element of this type of deal. You might call this a roll-up, where you're taking people in the same space and largely making one bigger business out of a bunch of similar pieces. Next is what I would call buying a business. This is where you're getting people, you're getting product, you've got something that you want to go forward. You've got something that instead of being something that get instantly merged in and you might like dropping a, a drop of ink into a glass of water where quickly it disappears, this is where you want the thing that's left to still have a, a lifetime of its own once you buy them. Here it's really about integration and alignment. How can you take something and bring it in and keep it additive and whole in the midst of a larger, larger organization? And then lastly for us at the, the far extreme is buying a platform. And here is, can we buy something that allows us to spend more money, invest in this business, and have it become something that we can grow organically? Or with us, it was, could it grow organically, or could we use that as a hub to start doing more M&A? Um, example was we got into the data backup business, data storage and backup. And so the first company we bought, we were really looking for not only somebody in that business, but we wanted that business to be run by somebody who wanted to stay with us and essentially create the genesis for maybe 10 more deals in that space. So they had to love the business, they had to know it, we had to think they were capable of doing M&A themselves. And so that was not just buying customers and it was not just buying a business, it was buying a platform that we thought we could run our whole playbook all over again in order to do that from there. And there it's about expansion and resources. If we buy you and we believe in you, can you go buy more companies? Can you spend ad dollars to grow organically? And how do we fund that in a way that is useful for both us and for the company we just bought? Um, so a few do's and don'ts from, again, marketing guy experience, very profit-driven uh, business model. Um, very important to buy what you need, um, as opposed to buying what is for sale. Um, it's, it's amazing how many people will buy what's for sale and not really realize what they need to grow their business. Again, is it, do you need a footprint in Germany for regulatory reasons? Do you need a product line that's complementary to yours? Do you need a, 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 a technology that fits? Um, go try to get what will make your business more successful, not what you think is available in the market. Uh, number two, invest in pipeline. In order to do what we did, where we were closing five, five M&A deals a quarter, we had to be talking to about 500 companies at any given time. So, and, and we would be talking to everybody, every space that we were in, or every space that we wanted to be in, we would be talking to every player that we could find. And they could be small, they could be big, they could be maybe wanting to sell, they could be years from selling, they could be doing fantastic, they could be distressed. But we talked to everybody on an ongoing basis, and I, I, I just made this analogy when we were having a drink over there. Uh, I've been on the receiving end of a real estate agent that has decided that if I ever sell my house, he's gonna be the guy that's gonna sell it for me. And so I get cards from him, I get flowers from him, he checks in on how I'm doing, because I'm a prospect and he has a very long time horizon. If he, if he gets a transaction out of me in the next 20 years, it will be worth it. And he's got a whole list, my whole neighborhood, I'm guessing, is on his prospect list. And he works it and he works it. And so we did the same thing. If you were in a space we were interested in, we would get to know you, your business, your marital status, um, your, your funding, all the things that we need to do, and we would trade with you, we'd give you insights about what we saw in the market. Because we wanted to be the one that the day you sold, you called us. And you said, I'm ready. And so the, the corollary to that is we, we didn't like to join a process. If you were for sale and you were in a known process, instantly that increased the amount we would have to pay, because there's a lot more people competing for the same company. It would probably mean that the seller was distracted because being in a, in a process consumes a lot of resources, so you're probably not keeping your eye on the ball of your own company. Um, we would lose all of our advantages and the, everything would slow down. So for us as a buyer, we did not want to join a process. Next is we had to be willing to walk, which is another very hard thing. Um, we would be looking at these companies and we'd have our targets of a certain IRR we wanted to hit, and if it was off by a couple percent and we couldn't make it, it work, we would walk away. 
And I, I think there were a couple, if I look back on all the companies that we walked away from, I think two of them went on to become multi-billion dollar public companies. And so you can kind of kick yourself for that. But if we had lowered the threshold where they had gotten through, we would have bought 100 companies that tanked, and we never, maybe never would have gotten to the finish line. So for us, we drew a hard line about where we wanted to do a deal. And if we could do a deal there, we would. And if we couldn't, we'd walk away and realize it just wasn't for us. And it's one of the reasons we were very successful is we had a very good filter up front. Some people have different ways they do business. But for us, it was if you got to pass that filter, we knew that we could make the deal work. Um, again, don't fall in love. You got to be able to walk away from a deal. And again, I'm telling you this from a company not that was going to do one or two deals or needed a specific technology. We were doing five deals a quarter. And so we, we knew that if we didn't do this deal, we would do the next deal. So we couldn't get caught up in any one specific one. We had to, again, trust our process. And last, um, we would try to buy assets. We would try to buy what we needed. Again, back to the buy what you need. We didn't always need a whole company. Often we just needed the assets of a company. And we would try to avoid buying entities where we could because those would commonly come with a lot of baggage maybe that was not interesting to us. On the sell side learnings, know your business. Um, it is amazing how many times we talk to people who don't know the fundamentals of their own business. Um, they don't know all of their, their accounting and, and financial numbers. They don't know who their competitors are. They don't know other M&A that's going on in the space. It's very dangerous if, if I, as a buyer, know much more about your company than you do as a seller. Um, and don't take your eye off the ball. It's another thing we've, uh, it wasn't common with us, but we were in enough deals that the, the span between doing a LOI and purchase typically can be very distractive to the seller. And you take your eye off the ball, you're trying to get a deal done, your numbers suffer, and you find out that the, the seller, I mean, the buyer is trying to renegotiate the terms of the deal because your trajectory that was like this when you first started talking looks like this by the time the deal is done, not because your business went south, but because you stopped paying attention to your business. So there's a window between LOI and closing the deal where you need to make sure you don't take your eye off the ball because that's a critical time when you can get crammed on your valuation uh, right at the last minute. Um, another key one, do your own due diligence. It's amazing how many companies do diligence on the company they're gonna buy, but they don't do diligence on the company that they're gonna sell to. And I think the most amazing thing is, it's, it's incredible how often the company that wants to buy you doesn't have the money. And, and, and you don't realize that until you do this dance with them for a month or two or three months, and you realize, they're, they didn't tell you, but while they're talking to you, they're going out and they're trying to raise the money. And if they can't raise the money, you wasted a lot of time. So the questions you want to ask are, where's the money coming from? What do you want to do with us? Why are you interested in the first place? Because you need to know as much about them. Again, if you are distressed, that's a different story. If you've got to sell because you're going under, you've got to sell because you're going under. If you're coming from a position, a position of strength, just like the dating analogy, you want to interview your buyer as much as they are interviewing you. Um, so don't have blind trust. You, it's very easy to get screwed. Most deals don't actually go through. And a lot of times they don't go through because the seller doesn't know enough about the buyer's position. Uh, have a plan. Uh, our company was very unique in that so many of the people that we bought became senior executives of a public company. But we bought people, that was one of the filters we used and in, in when we bought was knowing that that person had those type of aspirations and that kind of skill set. If you want to sell your company and run and go, you know, go buy a house in Aruba and enjoy it, that's great. Know that going into the deal. If you want to stay on and take, you know, you've got this great idea, you built a product and if you join with a bigger company, you think you can realize this vision, make sure that your plan is to stay because if that's not part of their plan, then eventually you find the reason you wanted to sell was to have a bigger uh, 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 megaphone for your product or your service and you're not there, then you lose. So don't go into it figuring out, you know, wanting to figure out as you go. Know what's in it for you in terms of both money, what happens to your people, what happens to your product, do you stay, do you go, what your earnout is. Have a plan for what's really a win for you. Um, and the, the reverse is true from buying side. Try to sell the entity in, in, in generic terms. If you don't want to be kept stuck with the bad parts of your business or the liabilities, um, sell the whole thing and avoid selling the assets. Again, there's exceptions to all these. This was the way we ran our playbook, is that if, if, if you sell off the good stuff and you're stuck with the others, again, unless you get enough money or that's, you somehow have a plan for how you're gonna resurrect a shell company, then I'd say um, sell the entity, not the, uh, the assets. So closing thoughts. Um, one is optionality is your best asset. If you find yourself having to sell or having to buy, there are some companies that need to fill a revenue hole and they have to buy. 
If you lose your optionality and you have to buy or sell, you give up much of your power. And so to the greatest extent possible, do what we did in having a pipeline of uh, possible uh, uh, sellers. If you have a company, have a pipeline of possible buyers. Do the reverse. Figure out everybody who could be a strategic or tactical buyer of your company well in advance. Start having relationships with them. Give them the opportunity to, to offer to buy you when they're desperate, and they might overpay or somehow give you something to your advantage, so that when the time is right, you don't have to go build a network. You don't have to do it at the worst time. You're, you're prepared. Next is, uh, to follow on a prior comment, timing is always the wild card. Um, companies will get in the process, they won't realize it, but they're being pit against another company that does a similar thing. So you feel like you're 90% along the way of getting a deal done, not realizing that the other guy thinks he's 90% of the, getting the deal done, and guess what? The day one of those deals closes, the other guy's done. He's not getting anything. So know that timing is one of those things that if you want to get your deal done, get your deal done. If you want to stall it in order to have your advantages, stall it. But you don't have full control, and timing can make a great deal a bad deal and a great deal back again. And so uh, realize that that's something you don't always control, so play that into your thinking. And last, to reestate, get to a new normal quickly. The, the disruption of, of selling a company or buying a company and having you, your lawyers, your accountants, your staff, your customers, your vendors all in this, this world, it's not a good place to be. Even on a great deal, it's not a good place to be. So the key is to figure out as quickly as possible how to find your way back to what you're, again, saying I said have a plan. How do you as quickly as possible make that plan realized and get everybody to a place where they can either move on or dive in on a new initiative? The longer you play around in, in all of the transition stuff, the worst off it's going to be for you. Uh, so thank you. That's, uh, that's what i got to say. If you want to grab me afterwards, I'd be happy to talk more. 70% of companies go out of business and probably 29% get acquired sometime over their uh, lifetime. Uh, very few people, very few companies survive for 100, 100 years. It's constantly going through change. Uh, I don't see M&A as an as a exit strategy. Uh, I've done three companies, uh, every, basically for about every 10 years, I do a company. And um, building a great product, building a great team uh, is really the strategy. And then as time goes on, uh, back to the point of optionality. You want to always have, be in a position where you have plenty of optionality. I spent two-thirds of my time as uh, starting companies and about a third of my time doing, uh, doing uh, venture, which is what I'm doing now, uh, looking for companies in SoCal for $500 to $1 million in revenue and helping them take it to the next level. I've been on both sides. Uh, I bought a lot of companies, especially at DoubleClick, probably did 20 companies. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about on the sales side, uh, which, is, which, could be, which is more typical. Uh, very few of us actually end up buying a lot of companies. Most of them end up selling to a, to a larger company. Um, I've probably been involved in four or five different transactions on the sales side. Uh, I'm going to talk about two in particular. Uh, DoubleClick, uh, which is a company that started back in 95. Um, and it was a public company, did an IPO, so that was kind of an interesting um, uh, sort of why we sold it uh, at the time. Uh, I'm going to talk a, little bit, a lot about why, because uh, that's what a lot of you probably struggle with and, and when you should actually sell a company and how you do it. And then the most recent one was, uh, was graphic. Um, I think M&A, mergers and acquisition, merger is probably a more of a legal term because there's almost virtually no merger. Uh, technically, uh, we merged with Amazon, uh, but Amazon would never know it. Uh, they definitely, <laughs> definitely acquired us. Um, and I think to, to Daniel's point, uh, I've actually never looked at, you know, I always tell people, they say, they, they insult me. I was like, if, you, if I had feelings, I, I'd be insulted right now. Uh, I never really took, you know, I, I love building companies. It was, it was very, it, a strong passion of mine, but it's not my child. I'm not selling my child. It's, you know, companies get built by teams of people. And a lot of times when you get to an M&A, uh, uh, you're, doing it, you're doing it because you think it's the best thing for the shareholders. Uh, you think it's the best thing for the employees. You think it's the best thing for the customers. You're really trying to optimize that equation. And it's a very, very difficult decision. But I'd never, ever looked at it as some, something like it was just me, me involved. There's many, many more people. So let me talk a little bit about DoubleClick. Uh, DoubleClick, we started in 1995 in, in, my, in my basement uh, in, in Georgia, which sounds a little creepy, but it was, it, we moved it to New York. And that was in the early days of the internet, and we, we experienced uh, explosive growth. We went from to, in a little over four years, 2,500 people, 25 countries. We did an IPO. Uh, everything was beautiful. Everyone was loving it. Uh, I ended up not being CEO uh, right before the crash, so I looked brilliant. 
uh, I pass the reins on to Kevin Ryan. All along the, all along the way, we are acquiring companies. Uh, we were doing market consolidation. Uh, we were also uh, very focused on, on expanding our product line to sell more products to, to customers. Um, and then we were also focused on, on uh, ultimately an acquisition, acquisition that got us in trouble, but uh, where we were uh, data companies, taking offline companies, and we were, we were merging it with um, online companies. So after the crash, uh, just to give you an idea um, how bleak it was, uh, we had just gone out and raised a bunch of money, so we were well positioned. But literally within three or four months, 70% 70 per, 70 of our customers went out of business. Uh, it was just devastating. We ended up laying off half the company. Um, everyone was unemployed in the internet business. Uh, not to feel too sorry for those people that we laid off. Most of them went on to join Google and Facebook and end up crushing it. Uh, so it, was, it wasn't too bad for them. But the company was in great turmoil. Um, and not only did we have sort of financial, everyone's options were underwater. Uh, a lot of their friends had been laid off. Uh, it was just a very, very uh, tough time for people. Uh, we were also in the news. If you remember Mark, Mark Zuckerberg testifying in front of the Senate for privacy, we were one of the first, because we were doing internet advertising, the whole privacy thing. People didn't know what it was, what was going on. People had conjured up all sorts of horrible things. So we were, unfortunately, the poster child for privacy, which kind of cast a pall on, uh, on, the, on the company as well. So we found ourselves in a, in a period where we had finally recovered, we had got all this past, past us, uh, and back in 2005, and what we found was that the company had gone through a lot of turmoil. We had basically four or five different product lines that we had determined, you know, the word synergy, if you ever heard the word synergy, we, you've heard synergy a lot, uh, be very wary of synergy. Uh, it's a very dangerous word, uh, very rarely materializes. Uh, in our case, we had basically assembled sort of three very strong businesses. We were a strong company. We were doing about $300 million in, in revenue. We were profitable. Uh, but we had three very distinct businesses. And we were really, and, and we had a management team that had gone through a lot of turmoil. Um, you just, you know, f f friends come and go and enemies accumulate. And it was a very stressful time. And we were in a situation where we actually had a lot of cash on the balance sheet. So we were highly unleveraged, which is a bad place to be, believe it or not, because uh, it's very difficult to make the needle move. And so it was really a case where it, the sum, the parts were worth a lot more than the whole. So we decided to auction off a public company. Um, which is somewhat unusual, and you try to do it very privately, very quietly, which is impossible, because there's 50 people that you send out packets to. And Google was actually at the table, um, and there was all sorts of companies, but the problem we had is that every company wanted a separate part of the company. Uh, now, we could have broken up the company ourselves, uh, but again, management was at risk, and it's very hard to break up a public company when you're public. So Humman Freeman came in, and they ended up acquiring the company. So they immediately took the cash, used that to buy the stock, and then they proceeded over the next three years to sell the individual pieces to the company uh, to other folks. And then ultimately, Google paid three times as much for a piece of the company uh, that, that they could have had the entire company for three years later. Uh, but double, uh, Google was, was very happy to do that because they didn't have the, uh, the pain of breaking up a company. Um, it's, I'm thrilled to say that Google, to this day, they say, I, I think they're doing billions of dollars of revenue with DoubleClick. It was a very, very successful um, uh, integration with the company. So I'm very happy that worked out very well. So that was a reason, you know, a lot of times, you know, you, you have management risk, you have, you have uh, the risk of breaking up of company, and so that really drove us to, for, to, to sell the company at this point. The next example I want to talk about is Graphic, which is more recent. So this is a company we started in, in 2009. Uh, it was to do vertical search engines. So if you think of kayak for travel, think of kayak for the other 100 big things in your life. Picking a dog, picking a medical school, picking a college, picking a, uh, whatever, what else would we do? Uh, ski resorts. We did, we did hundreds and hundreds of different things. It was a, gr it was a great product. Uh, we had 30 million visitors. Revenue was, we were one of the fastest growing companies in the area. Then a Google algorithm hit us. Uh, our traffic was very dependent on, on Google. Uh, most of our traffic was, and overnight our business halved. Uh, so we were very desperate. We had to figure out, we had to pivot. Uh, you've heard the word pivot. Pivot is very painful. Uh, and we had sort of three different areas that we could pivot to. And so we had a new, new business. This was still a business, but it was half, half in size. Uh, we start, launched a, 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 another business. 
But we also occurred to us at the time is we had the world's largest knowledge graph. You don't know what it is, I'm not gonna explain it to you, but Google had dubbed this term. And knowledge graph was really, really important in the personal assistant area. So think of a personal assistant that can answer any question. If you have an Alexa at home, or you have a, a, an i, what does uh, Apple call it, i, i something Siri, but they have the iPod, i, 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 i home. Uh, and then Google has, you know, whatever the Google calls it. Um, <laughs> they call it Google. Uh, so anyways, uh, the, the, the concept of amassing information was, was, was interesting to people. And we kept telling people, like, look, you know, we knew that those, every major company was pursuing this. They were spending hundreds of millions of dollars in this area. And we thought that was going to be our most valuable thing. So we went and talked to all those companies. Well, all those companies had already invested heavily in this area, and they all had their, their own view of, of doing it. And we weren't act, actually uh, uh, proving that we could do it in that, in that particular market. So they all said no. Um, and a lot of them didn't like our approach because they thought artificial intelligence was going to be the secret. But they learned all about us. Uh, and about it, we continued on with our business. And about a year later, uh, they had all experimented with what they thought was going to work with AI. Um, just to, if anyone here know the definition of artificial intelligence, it's everything a computer can't do today. Um, so a lot of them had bet heavy on AI, and it turned out that it was not a solution, that sometimes you got to roll up your sleeves and, and do it the hard way. Uh, so also during that time, uh, again, we didn't have a product to demonstrate to them. We just had, you know, believe us, we have this massive knowledge base. We can turn it into a product. Uh, we had hack a hackathon. And a bunch of engineers actually hacked together a, um, an Alexa skill that basically took the brains out of Alexa and replaced it with our brains. And we showed how our skill was better than Alexa. Who, who here is Alexa? Most of you. So, and by the way, Alexa does not listen to you. Um, that, that is a fallacy. It listens to Alexa, but with the word. Um, so we ripped out the brains and they, we shot a video and Ivan, uh, Dylan ripped out the brains and, and, and did the skill, shot a video, and Ivan sent it to um, Jeff Bezos, Jeff B at Amazon.com. Uh, and then we also <laughs> sent it to all the other folks that we had talked to, and it was an amazing video. You know, here's a company that they'd never really, they'd heard about us, but we had proven our technology uh, could work to them, work for them. So we started, we, we, we started getting, we, we tried to uh, orchestrate an auction. Uh, if you're on the sell side, you want an auction. If you're on the buy side, you definitely do not want an auction. Um, but we tried to orchestrate to get all these companies interested at the, at the same time. Uh, we had one company, I won't, I, a lot of these I can't say because of, of non-disclosure. Uh, we had one company we thought they were, they were gonna give us a huge price tag. Uh, we had agreed on price, they scheduled Saturday. You know, it was like, who has a meeting on Saturday morning? This is it, this is gonna be the meeting. And they said, eh, we're not interested. Um, it was a really bad Saturday. Um, the next offer uh, from a very large company who said we were an existential threat if they didn't have us. And so we're thinking we're really going to get a big offer now. Um, they gave us an offer uh, that was so bad. It was so low. It was so painful. I didn't think, I, I didn't think there could be a, a bad offer. Uh, like something worse than no, this was worse than no. It was, it was a very low price. And I was basically going to be enslaved for five years. It was literally, I've never, there was no way this thing was legal. Uh, they were going to car back <laughs> all my equity, pay me nothing, and I would have to work. Uh, <laughs> but the important thing is we, we, had, we had an offer, uh, which is the most important thing when you're selling a company in, in an auction-like environment is you got to get an offer. People don't have to know what that offer is. They know it's from a big company. Uh, you, you paint it up, and that forced all the other companies to really get on the, uh, on the ball to, to take a look at this. Because this was a critical area. This was an area where, on the technology side, was going to be the future of these companies. It's really important. And, and from a corporate dev, dev side, they couldn't be the guy that walked away from this because they were too lazy. They had to take a look at this technology. Uh, Amazon ultimately was, was a company uh, that we end up spending the most time with. Uh, the video really worked. And we... Um, uh, that guy, I, I got to know the corp dev guy really well. He was one of the best people I've ever worked with. Uh, he was very smart. He knew that the other companies were interested. Uh, they spent a lot of time doing due diligence, due diligence on the company, and they forced us to sign a, an agreement very quick, uh, which was smart, to keep it out of the auction. Now, Amazon does a, um, 
they judge a year later, they measure whether, whether an acquisition was good or not. And the way they measure it is that, would you have paid double the price? Uh, and the answer was yes, which is good. So by focusing on product, uh, which is, I think they have 20 openings now here in, here in, in um, Santa Barbara. So they're growing the unit. Uh, I was there, part of the deal. Uh, I can't go too much in the deal, but it was basically, uh, it was uh, paid the investors, they paid the, uh, it was, most of it was retention. So it was extraordinarily good for the, for the, for the uh, employees. I was the one where they actually clawed back um, most of my equity to make me, uh, I had to work there for a year. And my focus was really for that year. I tell you the truth, I didn't think I, I was, I, you know, I'm an old dog. I didn't think I could learn any new tricks. Uh, Amazon turned out to be a great company. I learned a ton at Amazon. Uh, there was some goofy stuff. There was alpha space kind of stuff. But it was, it was ultimately, it was a really, really good company. Uh, and my goal was to focus on getting them integrated into Amazon, kind of fight all the battles that go on, uh, and then leave it in a good position. The, um, some of the do's and don'ts, so I kind of offset it with buyer and seller. So a seller has perfect information. Uh, this is really, really important. Uh, the seller has, they know everything. They know where all the skeletons are. Uh, and as a seller, you should control, you should ultimately disclose all bad information, but you should control how it gets disclosed. One clarification on, on uh, Heike, it was the, the thing that I warned the executive team was, was do not use this as an opportunity to position yourself um, and to, to get your, uh, position yourself over your, your colleagues. Like how the organization acquisition is one thing, how it gets organized comes later, and a year from now, the organization's gonna be completely different. So don't use this as a way of undercutting your other uh, team members, because I've seen so many deals blow up uh, because of that. Uh, nobody wins in an auction, uh, but sellers do win in an auction. Uh, I was in a deal one time, a public company, it was, um, uh, I was in one room, uh, our arch rival was in another room, and, and literally the bids kept going back and forth, and you just get, your, you just get so frothy, and it was up to $500 million. And this new M&A guy that we had just hired, and I, yeah, I wanted to win this thing, win this thing. It was a heat of the moment, very competitive. And the new M&A guy goes, he goes, Kevin, would you want this company for free? And I'm like, no, it's a piece of shit. It's, this is a terrible company, it's horrible. <laughs> And he goes, well, why are we buying it? And you're like, that's, a, that's, your bro that's exactly right. So we stuck it to the other company and ultimately ended up destroying our, our, uh, our rival. Um, <laughs> no matter how, how good you think you are, you're not going to fix bad DNA. They got a bad team, they got a bad product, you're not going to fix it. I don't care how good you are, and I'm sure Daniel can, can attest to that. Um, so if you're on the seller side, build great products and teams. That's all you should focus, focus on. If you build a great product, great team, Lots of people are going to want to buy you. Uh, market consolidation, slam dunk. If you're going to do an acquisition or you're going to get acquired by somebody, market consolidation works. If you're the small company and all value accrues to the number one, you know, all markets have three competitors. Number one accrues virtually 90% of all the value. Uh, so you want to make sure that you know your competitors stay close. Uh, I always challenge people before you buy it, uh, before you buy a company, why don't you just build it? I mean, that's what you're in the market for. Why aren't you building it? Um, I used to give the, I called it the godfather speech. Uh, I'd go to companies, I'd say, look, we can buy you for 50 million, uh, or I can invest $10 million, build it ourselves, and I will be your worst nightmare. Um, which one would you like? Uh, so that was sort of an approach that, that seemed to work well. Um, <laughs> Uh, keep the team, uh, this is more of a, you know, people get confused over cap table when you're actually getting, uh, when you're getting acquired. They think, okay, how much I own is actually what I'm going to get. Most deals, uh, the buyer doesn't care, I'm sure you guys can attest, the buyer does not care about venture capital people. They don't care about your investors. Those investors are gone. And venture capital people understand that. Most, most of the, the, the value, a lot of the value is going to come on the long tail. So for example, employees at, at Graphic, uh, they might have owned uh, X percent, but they actually probably got 10, 10x uh, what that percent is. So, so don't focus too much on the cap table. Uh, get any offer. I don't care what it is, even that horrific offer we got. Uh, you got to get an offer. That, that creates urgency within the process once people know you're in play. Uh, and then on the other one is if you're buying, time is on your side. Usually, time is on your side. More information gets revealed. People become more desperate. Uh, you learn more. People become more committed, uh, but take your time. And that is it. Our time's up. And this is now the part where we're switching to the Q and A session, and I'm actually turning it back on all of you. Does any of you have a question to the other speaker? 
Well, just one question I asked, asked earlier, which was to Daniel, was which, and you can answer this as well, uh, which was what percent of your deals were like great, uh, wish you never met them, uh, and sort of in between? Yeah, and I think what I said was uh, probably about a quarter of our deals were great. Um, about a quarter of our deals um, wish I had never met them. <laughs> it's a bad date. <laughs> Um, and probably the, the, uh, the other is, you know, you get some good and some bad, so you just, uh, then it's really up to the management team that's acquiring the company to make something out of it. But um, to your comment earlier, Kevin, about can't fix bad DNA, couldn't agree more with that uh, statement. Yeah, it's on our side. We, we only did one deal that kind of was like this out of all those, but we did so much work up front. The machine was so, so geared to getting rid of false positives and to only going forward with deals that made sense to us, that we had almost, you know, we, we, we wasted a lot of time on deals we didn't do, but once we did a deal, they almost all worked. I wanna talk a bit about early indicators from both sides. How do you know early on that it's worth even starting to date? What, is the, what are the alarms you may wanna be aware, not even going further? Mm -hmm. What are the right things to go down further? It depends what the company is. I, I mean, oh, uh, thank you. Microsoft, I think is, was famous, I don't know if they're still famous for, they talk to you to get information. Um, so that's, you gotta be leery about why people are talking to you. Um, you learn a lot, you have to disclose a lot when you're on the sell side. And a lot of people are using it for nefarious reasons. But ultimately you have to, that's why I think you have to qualify, you gotta make sure they have the money, that there's a deep interest, it's, it's important to them before you start disclosing everything. For me, the, a lot of times the key thing, and from a buyer standpoint, is understanding who the customers are. You know, do they have have do they have happy customers? Have the customers been with them for a long time? Do they stay with them? Is there some loyalty uh, from their customers to the company that uh, goes a long way? And the management can tell you all sorts of things, but you know what's actually coming from their customer base is key. And I'd say from our perspective, it was complex ownership would be the first kind of yellow flag for us is if we wanted mm -hmm. to do a lot of deals and do them fast, the more we'd have to do of dancing around with split personalities and things like that, it kind of blew our whole way of doing business. So the more complicated the ownership was, the more we tended to, to take a quick look and move on. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, like addressing some of the entrepreneurs here in the room and Daniel, you talked about preparing for acquisition or preparing to sell. What should you do? When should you think about an advisor? What type of advisor? What should you not do? Yeah, uh, from my perspective, if you're, if you're preparing to sell your company, uh, once you've made that mental switch that I'm, I'm going down this path, I'm gonna, you know, I'd like to either sell it because I wanna get out of, I wanna get out of the business or I wanna sell it because I wanna build something bigger with a, with a bigger partner. That's, to me, the time when you really need to start uh, getting the right advisors. Um, and as I said in my, uh, in my presentation, you really use, need to use that opportunity to educate yourself because the more people you talk to, uh, the better off you'll be both in selecting the right advisor but also in understanding you know, what, uh, what questions to ask. Yeah, I think you run into, um, and you see this with venture investing too, is that people don't have a good foundation. It's a very complicated ownership structure, I think, which is what you're talking about, is that you know, they, they don't hire the lawyer early on. Uh, they don't get their cap table you know, very well structured. They don't have good contracts. They don't have good uh, accounting system. They don't have good measurement. It's just kind of a, they just don't have a good foundation. Mm -hmm. So let's assume we've started dating. We're even closing the deal. Camilla, question for you. This famous day one, when those two companies become one, what do you want to prepare for day one? What do you want to make sure is aligned? Yeah, well, I, I think the first advice is um, don't make day one bigger than day one actually is, right? At day one is usually just a, it's a, it's a legal day where, you know, the entities become one. And I think oftentimes people get so caught up in that day one. I often think of it as multiple day ones when you're going to put your commercial organization together uh, one is, uh, you know, your benefits are going to merge as day one. And so actually being very thoughtful as to what the roadmap is over the next, you know, 18 months uh, to two years and thinking about multiple day ones rather than one big bang, uh, mm -hmm. I think is, is really important. But I also think the other thing uh, that, that is important from the beginning is um, 
and we heard a little bit about this in some of the panel discussions, which is, you know, retaining key talent is really important, um, and thinking through what the story is uh, that you're you're defining to your both your employees to your uh, uh, your customers, and having that well thought out and communicated, I think is 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 quite important. Yeah, I think having the story is that for me because a lot of the other stuff are kind of table stakes, but having the story right. And it's kind of at the, the, the single, like one sentence or two sentence level where yeah. every employee, what they tell their spouse when they get home is the same thing that a customer service rep tells somebody that is a, a worried customer that, you know, you've got that really boiled down to, hey, we're becoming the German office of this company and our founder is going to stay on and head the region, whatever the story. And people say, I get it. And they can choose to buy in or not buy in. But the problem is when there's four stories and people start trying to figure out which of the stories it's true or if any of them are. And if you can start firm that first day with this is where we're going, it's a lot easier to build momentum than it is if people either don't understand or they're having to guess which of the stories is true. It kind of leads me to successful cultural integration or maybe not successful cultural integration. What have you seen? What works? Especially from yeah. a long-term perspective, yes. 20 years later. Right, yes. So from a, there's, there's different types of cultural integration. Um, and there's the issue around, you know, we, 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 as we Acuity have dealt with companies from all over the world. So there's that first piece of cultural integration. The way people do business in Indonesia is quite different than the way that people do business in Germany, uh, as you might imagine. So, um, and actually being a, being a global company is, is really key. Uh, to understand that and to understand what it is that you can change and should change and what it is that you just need to leave alone. Uh, and whether that is a cultural uh, uh, topic that is related to the country or simply organizations develop their own culture and sometimes you should leave that alone um, for, you know, to, because it, it has tremendous value uh, but there's um, also you need to, at the same time, make sure that you are, there's an overriding um, okay. cultural integration, so to speak, that happens. So because you, the one thing you do want to avoid is having an us and them situation okay. once you have, um, the, you know, the two companies together. Mm -hmm. Anybody, anything to add? I think, I mean, you experienced the culture integration. It, it was interesting. I think Amazon was a little bit, they have a reputation, they did a New York Times article, they're a bit apologetic about how sort of hardcore they, they can be and people work really hard and stuff. And so they were a little worried about how we would react. And we were like, yeah, this, we, this is us. You know, the, the, cultural, the cultural fit was very, very strong. Uh, they were good at also listening to, to your point. They, you know, look, they made it very clear there's certain things you can keep doing culturally. Like there's something that's important, you know, like we had snacks and they don't, unlike most, tech companies, they don't, they don't offer snacks. You go up to <laughs> Seattle, you know, right. and we do like workouts at lunchtime. And they're like, that's cool. You know, it's not, it, you keep doing that. Other stuff, they're very clear. Like you're going to do promotions this way. You're going to do e e interviews this way. You know, there's, it was very clear. And, and I think and you were there. I mean, we, we made it very, we made it very clear to everyone. We switched over very quickly. Uh, they were surprised at how quick we learned the new system. It's just a millennial thing that where you guys all wanted to, Sure. Millennials always want to learn. Uh, so they're actually anxious. <laughs> they, they switched over like in a, in a, in a week. Yeah. Everyone was switched over. Third, a year and a half later, we still have snacks. We still have you snacks. You still got snacks. <laughs> yep, we do. I think for us, it was sending somebody, having FaceTime, having mm -hmm. a presence. So we'd buy somebody in a different area. We'd send somebody there, mm -hmm. and they would stay. Mm -hmm. And they would be somebody that could be asked questions. They'd, a lot, sometimes it wasn't even somebody that was relevant to that business. We'd send them there, and they'd sit at a desk, and they'd do their job. And they would be the person that says, when Mike says this, what does he mean? If I need to get a PO approved to who I talk to, it kind of became a, almost a, a cultural emissary to the mothership. And over time, that worked its way out and the person could come home. But having somebody there that could answer those questions was really critical to building that trust. Yeah, I, I, you know, oftentimes you hear cultural or culture and it's how you feel and it's, you know, you send a culture survey, are you happy, are you not? When I think of culture, um, it's what are the behaviors that are changing day to day. So, and, and you wanna get down to that because that's what actually matters. Uh, so oftentimes it's everything from, you know, we, 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 we always have a deck 
in our meetings, or we don't, or we we enter the building, you know, and start the day at eight thirty, or um, you know, how do we? Is it a on the phone type of place, or do we do we send emails? Like, what is it that that gets people going day to day, and being very clear about what some of those behaviors are, uh, and then actually actually doing the work to figure out, you know, this is the kind of uh, the new way uh, that we're actually going to do work. I also think. You know, sometimes I hear it's a merger of equals, and I, I believe there's never a merger of equals. There's always an acquirer, and there's always uh, someone who got bought. Um, and I think that's important because you have to make choices in any, any merger. And so, you know, the mergers that I see as successful are the ones where, you know, you make the tough calls and you make choices and, and you, you move forward with it. The ones that I see that aren't successful, I look at the United and Continental uh, airlines merger that, that was seen as as in, as successful because they were trying to uh, be equal about everything, and so you know we're going to 50% this and 50% that, and they never made hard choices. Everything from what you know technology stack we're going to use to um, you know how we're, what's the the uh, the way we we serve uh, to our customers on the plane, and so making choices is a real important part of figuring out what the right cultural fabric is going to be going forward. But to that point of early wins, I know that we, we bought smaller companies, so it was a million revenue to maybe 70 million was the biggest I was involved in. And things like snacks, we won over a deal when we said the dogs could stay. It was like, they, they trusted us. The dog, you know, we didn't have dogs in our office, they could keep the dogs in their office. They felt that we understood them, and it was the single thing probably that made the biggest difference in th yeah. being able to move forward. Yeah. I would like actually to open the mic to all of you, if you do have a question from the panelists, raise your hand. We will come over with a microphone and allow you to ask a few questions. We do have one question here. Hi, thanks for speaking tonight. It's been interesting to hear your thoughts. And I'm curious what you would say about, you know, the structure of an acquisition where it's typically going to be at least in my space in medical technology, its acquisition is an upfront payment and then a series of milestone payments that might be over like a five-year period. Um, do you typically see that those milestone payments actually coming to fruition? Um, a lot of people say they never see any of the milestone payments. Some people say you see some of it. Um, and how, what would be your advice for you know, being successful in receiving and making tangible those milestone payments? I'm not sure. Milestone payments or, or uh, earnouts, people talk about them. I've never done them. Um, I know most companies won't do them because the only ones who make money are the lawyers uh, in the lawsuits that follow. I mean, how do you acquire somebody and not integrate them in every way? I, I don't know if you've, yeah, you've done we, them. We've actually done a few with, miles, with earnouts. And the advice that I would have to somebody who's selling with earnouts uh, is that do your due diligence in terms of who's buying you. One of the things that we've been asked uh, when we were working the earnouts, uh, and I would always say talk to this company, this company, you know, this person, this person, that person who we've we've acquired. We did earnouts. We've always, uh, except for I think one time, we've always paid the earnouts to the full amount, and. Um, so it's really, it's a good tool to use when the buyer and the seller can, cannot come to agreement in terms of what the value of the company is. Because a lot of times the seller thinks, the seller thinks, you know, my company's gonna grow to a billion dollars and you know, it's worth this much and the buyer just does, doesn't quote, buy the, those, those projections. So it can be a useful tool. They are complicated, um, so yes, Lawyers will make money in terms of the earnouts. I uh, hope there's not any lawyers here. I know there's one there. So. <laughs> uh, uh, but you know, generally, uh, generally they can work, but uh, you need to be cautious uh, when with them. And uh, if you're a seller, as I said, really do your due diligence in terms of um, you know how that company behaves. But as a buyer, aren't you extremely nervous? No, because not super nervous because if I, I'd be happy to pay the higher valuation because that means the company is super successful. The, it's been one of those, you know, was I happy to pay double? Yes. <laughs> uh, so it's not, not 
very so nervous. So it's usually like a standalone product, something that you can partition off and it's, measure easily? It is a, usually a standalone product. In some cases, it's been, or now it's based on the product needs to be developed to um, the next level, so to speak. So it's not, the earn out is not even based on some revenue amount. It's simply based on the fact that you need to you know, port the product to a new technology or something along those lines. So it's really a way in, of incentive management to, you know, be with a company and focus on the right areas that the company would like to um, get focused on. Yeah, and, and I don't know your space, but in the deals I've done, we wouldn't do anything like that. It would just introduce too much risk. We did some earnouts, but it was mainly to keep founders in place for a certain amount of time. Beyond that, um, those would be too risky for us to be buying something that we didn't know how it was going to play out. Yep, most earnouts are, are involved with that. There's some type of, of um, time-based um, options, stock, you know, whatever it is. So over a four-year period. So if it's not happening, you, you get rid of the people. Um, or if they leave, they lose, lose a lot of the value. Yeah. Hi, I'm curious about um, private company uh, transactions. I know you've all bought a lot of private companies, but have you ever purchased companies while you were private, and what were the different issues involved in that? It's usually stock for stock, so it, the problem is relative valuation. Back in the internet days, I was always, uh, as my one board member described it, it's, it's Kevin, it's, it's trading your, ten, uh, your, your million dollar dog for two, two five hundred thousand dollar cats, so it all comes down to re like relative valuation, since there's usually no cash involved. Hi. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> From a seller's point of view, uh, what are some strategies or tactics that can be used to value or get credit for your uh, product pipeline, mm -hmm. which hasn't been commercialized yet, but something that you believe has a lot of value? Seller, that probably goes to you, Kevin. The product pipeline. The product pipeline? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's tough to sell a company unless you've got, I mean, co companies usually don't buy ideas. They don't, they buy revenue. They buy, you know, completed products. I mean, they're, I think they're going to discount future stuff to near zero. I mean, I think it's a really hard, hard sell. Um, Mike, Daniel? Yeah, I, I would agree. If you haven't, uh, if you haven't yet sold, and have something going, you're basically just selling maybe a technology or an idea, that, which could be valuable to a company, but in terms of actually putting any value in terms of that future revenue, is, it would be very hard. I just have a quick one for Kevin. I'm gonna try and get some more questions on this side of the room as well, but um, you said that you got stood up on a Saturday, but then you got an auction process going. Did the Saturday company come back to the party? No. <laughs> no. In fact, it turned out, I think it's probably one of their biggest regrets, and their, their AI path failed. I'll let you guess. I mean, you can kind of see the relative performance of the different personal assistants out there. One of them is really bad. <laughs> <laughs> Could have been really good. Uh, Question for Kevin in graphic. When did uh, the Alexa come on your radar as a kind of a strategy to boost um, graphic? Or was it totally just a, 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 one of your uh, developers saying, hey, we should try this out? I, I mean, I think it was more Google when, when Google bought, and I'm forgetting the name of the company, uh, but to build their knowledge graph. So we knew, and then we realized that we had a knowledge graph. So we started looking at that area, but it was very early. Early on, um, I mean, the first time I heard of Alexa was was at a TMP class. I asked new students about cool technology that they that they've seen, uh, and this woman went on for ten minutes talking about how in love she was with this new. And I've never heard of anyone in my thirty years of technology talk about loving anything technology. Uh, and she just loved this thing called Alexa. I, I, I didn't know what it was, and so started looking into it. Um, uh, it was good. Thank you. Do you have one question over there and then another one in the back. So just a quick question here then. Um, you talked about, Kevin, about how, you know, companies don't last for 100 years and, you know, things happen. And I wonder if you can maybe spend some time uh, discussing when you think 
it's time to sell as a company? Like, there, is there some real telltale signs that it was like, dude, this company's got to be sold? Um, I mean, I've, I've sold companies, not the two examples I gave, when you had to sell, like it's running out of cash, um, so you don't have a choice. That's often when you have to sell. It's a terrible time to sell, um, unless you get a really, really um, anxious buyer. I, I mean, I think it comes down to, as I was trying to talk more about the sort of why, like what, what brings you to this point, and I think it's about optionality. You take a look at, okay, here's, here's what we're doing today, and in, in really both those cases we had sort of a, a huge change in market, we had management risk, we had new product risk. Uh, and then you have another area that you had not contemplated when you started the, started the company, uh, these new personal assistants, and you see that, that your technology, your company could help, help them. So a lot of it is just, it, you know, the, you, the hand you, you got dealt with in the beginning is, is cards have turned up differently and the market's changed and you kind of realize, you know, you got to explore this, this, this option. So it really is about optionality. I and mean, it wasn't like we had, you know, a graphic we had to sell. We had, we had two, three very viable products that we could have developed, but there was management risk. <clears throat> people were burned out. When you pivot, you know, when you pivot a couple times, uh, people get burned out. We did have one question in the back. Yeah. yeah was, <clears throat> excuse me. So, uh, Mike, one of your recommendations was uh, do not sell assets. But, Kevin, it looks like you did a pretty good job of selling assets Based on your experience, could you kind of elaborate on the pros and cons of that? I missed that last part. The the last, and, oh, based on your, both of your experiences, can you elaborate on the pros and cons of that? Well, I'm not sure that you might have been talking about equity versus asset sale. Mike, was that what you were talking about? Yeah, about buying an entity versus buying the assets. Yeah. So I think one of them was more of a structural thing. Do you buy the, do you buy the equity or do you buy uh, the assets? Assets are usually very rarely done and... But to your point, graphic was, I mean, all the businesses got, uh, all of our revenue generating businesses got wiped out uh, by, by Amazon. It, it wasn't just Amazon, by the way, it was a joint decision. We, you know, we took a look at it. None of those businesses fit in with, with Amazon business. So they were buying the asset, but they bought the company. Hmm? Yep, um, just a quick question. I wanted to talk about talent retention. Um, Kevin, you mentioned uh, giving Employer, employees 10 times their equity. Um, Mike, you talked about having the right story. Um, what are some tactics that you guys use to kind of maintain that tactic, maintain that talent from the acquirer standpoint and then also from being bought standpoint? Have your best salesperson be the face of the deal once it gets <laughs> done. Because really you're selling, you're, you're selling over every day, you're selling this is why you're important, this is what we're doing, this is why it's better together, and you come back the next day, and you sell it again, and you come back the next day, and yes, the dogs are still welcome, yes, the snacks are gonna stay past the first 30 days, and you sell, and you sell, and if you get somebody who thinks it's, you don't have to do that, and they're the face or the interface of what you're doing, it really costs you. So you have to have the right structure in place, but you really, you do have to sell. You have to sell to get the deal done, and you have to sell maybe even harder once the deal is done to get people to buy into the vision. Well, so I'm curious about Camilo's, like, um point on talent um, retention because I know this is one of your... Yeah, I mean, I... I, I uh, um, so a couple things. W one, I always advise you should know who your top talent is and who you want to retain before day one, before the deal's done. And if you've waited until day one, you're too late because people are trying, they know, you know, your, your competitors are going to try and steal. They're already getting calls from the headhunters um, and and it's a it's a it's a period where you're exposed. Two, I um, often will have the CEO, you know, multi-billion-dollar company or whatever the size is, pick up the phone and start calling folks, um, saying how important you are, stopping by, creating a personal connection, but just something to show that you care. And oftentimes that goes a lot further than any kind of financial incentive. Uh, uh, can be. I, I do think in, in most of the deals I do, there usually is some kind of retention package that's usually timed to uh, a, tied to a, a time period and oftentimes can be tied to performance. So you get people motivated because you don't want, you know, oftentimes I see uh, uh, where you have people kind of lose focus um, 
if, the, if it's a long period before close, between when the deal is announced and between close, uh, that's also a very vulnerable time uh, because people are, you know, they're thinking about the deal and not actively engaging um, in, in uh, running the business. You'd have to add, I think, if the retention package is what's keeping your employees there, it's the wrong thing. Uh, it's important, uh, don't get me wrong, but ultimately you need to establish an emotional connection. If you don't do that, then yeah. uh, you're going to end up uh, in, uh, in a bad place. Yeah. So I, I, I agree with that, but the retention pack, package is a strong signal saying that, sure. that they matter. Look, most, people, most people are concerned they're going to lose their job. And in market consolidations, by the way, most, a lot of people do lose their job. Uh, and we have to be upfront with people about that too and have some type of fair package for folks. Yeah. Uh, we were very transparent because some people did lose their job during the, during the acquisition and even they got you know, some type of, 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 of package. But the retention is super important because this is a very emotional time when a deal happens, right? It's like going to a new school or, or uh, you know, moving to a new town or switching jobs. Like it's an emotional time and people make, can make irrational quick decisions. So keeping them, retaining them, then they figure out, you know, it's, 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 it's an exciting place to work, it's a good job, they're making more money, I mean, life is good. You get over that emotional period. But if you think about maybe a product team, you buy a company because they have a cool product, the first thing you do is the next day, you say, can you come to headquarters mm -hmm. and tell us what you're doing so we can figure yep. out how to reach? You get them thinking that they're, you, you make it real what they're there to do, mm -hmm. and you give them the chance to show off what they're good at, and you give them a chance to start working on it the next day. Mm -hmm. A lot of that balanced with the right incentives, people want to do good work. And if, if you tell them, yeah, we want you to do good work too, and let's get, to, get on it together, and you don't have these time gaps, and you don't let the getting to the new normal lapse too long, people want to get back to work. And you're yeah. just giving them that opportunity is really critical. And for you, you could probably say, look, it, we, have, we have 100 times more salespeople selling, selling our product. More people are going to be using our product. That's exciting for an engineer. <laughs> and it's exciting, uh, you know, what's your career path? So, you know, hey, you've been acquired and you're now part of an organization and there's many different paths or opportunities from a learning standpoint or professional standpoint. And I think playing that up and, and showing how this person is going to be, has a, has a path forward at the organization and isn't just a, a number, I think goes a, a long, a long way in, in retaining talent. Mm -hmm. We have time for one more question. We have somebody here in the front. Sure. Um, I have a question for Mike and maybe others can weigh in on this too, but your company did so many acquisitions and really invested time and resources up front to make those successful. It seems that it was a very big part of your company's strategy and a core competency. Could you speak a little bit about how your organization maybe made the decision to invest in that as a competency and you know, why that was the right decision for your business? I think the company, well first, I think it was a little bit born of necessity because when, when J2 bought EFAX, the market went into a complete tank. So they realized both it was hard to grow their own business and yet the assets that were available, all these companies that were interesting, that had developed some cool stuff, that had customers, that had great employees, but there was a period of time where there was no value on those companies. So J2 made the smart move, they had cash, and there wasn't a lot to invest the cash in acquiring customers because the market was exploded, but they started looking around and seeing all these great assets that they could buy that were suddenly very pushed down in their valuations. So brought those in, the market started going well again, and we realized we can grow these businesses organically. And so, it, but then all of those companies, that the, the rest of the companies that could have been bought started increasing in their value. So we realized, okay, those are a lot harder to buy now on the, uh, the way we like to do it. So we ended up kind of developing a practice where we could both, you could wait for the times to be bad, or you could just cast a wider net and realize that if we were aggressive <coughs> about looking for companies that weren't for sale, then we could find some real gems, and that was what we did. But in order to do that, it was back to the real estate analogy, we had to knock on every door constantly, but we knew nobody else was doing it. And maybe that's what a lot of the maybe mid-market or small market PE firms do, is they realize it's a very underserved, if you've got a business with one to 25 million bucks of revenue, you're too small for a big part of the world to care about. And yet, if you can roll them up right and build something together right, we were a very rare buyer for those. So we went after having more information than anybody else did, that we work harder than anybody else did, and we went after kind of an underserved set of sellers. And I think we were able to figure out a way to make a good business out of that. And if we balance that with organic growth, it gave us a very resilient business to be able to kind of keep growing and do so very profitably. But it was a, it was a very concerted effort, a little bit of luck in J2 buying EFAX the first time kind of as a, as a, a you know, good fortune, figuring out that that was a model that could be replicated and having it be for a long time that other people weren't doing the same thing.
Wh wh what years was that? Was that early 2000s? 2000 was when they bought us, and then we ran that playbook until I left in 2015. Okay. But the thing was, it got harder. The, the bigger yeah. we got, we had to do bigger deals, and when you do bigger deals, it's harder to find hidden gems as the companies get bigger. So it got harder and harder to do, but in this, this, the range when we were doing it, buying companies, again, that are a million bucks to 25 or $50 million, especially if you've got good information, we had a, a big advantage over a lot of people who were treating it more casually. But again, as, as the economy's better or as your company gets bigger and you need to do bigger deals, it becomes harder. Camilo, Mike, Kevin, Daniel, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for sharing yeah, it with you. them. Thank you.